Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's here, too. And that makes this a timely topical, not timely, as in fork times. I meant to say timely, topical episode of Stuff You Should Know. That's a great forecast of how it's going to go, too, I think. Forecast? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, is this really us, or is it AI-generated Josh and Chuck? Uh, until this year, I would have been like, don't be preposterous. Now I'm like, just give it some time. <laughs> you know how we would know is if it said, if one of us said, of course it's the real us, we met in the office and bonded over our Van Halen denim vests. Yeah, we'd be like, sucker, you just fell for the <laughs> oldest trap in the book, the Sicilian switcheroo. Yeah, a.k.a. fake Wikipedia entry stuff. Is that still up? I haven't been to our Wikipedia page in years, so I don't know. Well, regardless, we're not talking about Wikipedia, although it does kind of fall into the... Sure, it figures in. ...the rubric of this. Not sure if I used that word correctly, but it felt right. Um, we're talking today about um, what are in the biz known as large language models, but more colloquially known by basically their, their public-facing names, things like ChatGPT or BARD or Bing AI. But essentially what they all are are algorithms, mm -hmm. artificially intelligent algorithms that are trained on text Tons and tons and tons of text, written English language stuff um, that are so good at recognizing patterns in those things that they can actually simulate a conversation with you, the person on the other side of the computer, asking them questions. Yeah, this is uh, it's going to be fun doing this episode over every six months. <laughs> That's right. Until we're replaced. Totally. So I, I think we should say, though, like this is we're going to. Like, this is such a huge, wide topic mm -hmm. that is just, we're, we're in the ignition phase. Like, the fuse just caught, right? Yeah. Um, that we're going to really try to keep it narrow, just strictly to large language models and the immediate effect they're planning on having or they're going to have. Hopefully, they're not planning on anything yet. Um, but I really would like to do one on how to keep, AI friendly and keeping it from running away. So yeah. I, th I say we just kind of avoid that whole kind of stuff. And really, I'm talking to myself right now, at <laughs> least for this episode. OK, yeah. You know, we're going to kind of explain uh, how these things work and what the initial applications look like and kind of where we are right now and then what it could mean for like jobs and the economy and stuff like that. But you're right. It is um, is a whole ball of wax, as you well know. Uh, and this is a great time to plug. The End of the World with Josh Clark, which is still oh. out there. You can still listen to it. The truth is out there in the <laughs> form of The End of the World with Josh Clark. Yeah, that's a great 10-part uh, series that you did. And AI is among those existential risks, mm -hmm. existential, that you covered. Yeah, it's episode four, I believe. And Chuck, like, just from having done that research and forming my own opinions over the years about this. Yeah. Like, I I'm... It's staggering to me that we're like we've just entered like yeah. what's going to be the most um, revolutionary transitional yeah. phase in the entire history of humanity, you can argue. Everything else took place over very long periods of time. We started playing with stone tools and then we started building cities. All this stuff took place over thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. We just entered a period where stuff's going to start happening within weeks pretty soon. Um, as of 2023, the whole thing just started. Yeah, and none of this was around like this when you did The End of the World, and that was, what, like five years ago-ish? Yeah, it was 2018. All this was being worked on, but it, we hadn't hit that point. Like, all this was pretty much predicted and projected, and it right. was clear that this was the direction people were going. And it's here, baby. Yeah, it is. It's nuts, but it's actually here. So what we're talking about are large language models, which is a type of neural net, neural network that are easiest to think of in terms of like a human brain, where you have neurons that are connected to other neurons, but they're not connected to some other neurons. And all of those neural connections um, kind of uh, are activated by inputs that 
put out something like your conscious experience or you say a sentence or something like that. It's it's very similar in its most basic nature, I guess. Yeah. I mean, Livia uh, helped us out with this and she did a great job, I think. And um, Google themselves basically say, you know what, it's really it's sort of like uh, how when you go to search for something on our our search engine tool. Mm -hmm. Is there a weirder way I could have said that? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Our handy search bar. Uh, then, you know, basically what we're doing is auto completing um, like uh, an analysis of like probability, like like what you're typing. Um, if you type in, you know, John Coltrane or start to chop type in John Cole, mm -hmm. it, it might finish it out as John Coltrane, a love supreme or John Coltrane jazz. And they're saying, you know, what what is happening now with these uh, LLMs is it's the same thing. It's just it's got way more data, way more calculations in in the algorithm. Mm -hmm. So it's not just completing like a word or two. It's potentially, you know, hey, rewrite the Bible or whatever you tell it to do. Yeah. And the big difference is in the amount of info the the neural network is capable of taking into consideration. Yeah. Um, so may I for a minute? Oh, please. So imagine with one of those autocomplete suggestion tools like they have on, on Google search. Mm -hmm. if, if there's 500,000 words in the English language, that means that you have 500,000 words that a person could possibly put in. Mm -hmm. That's the input into the neural network. Mm -hmm. And then there's 500,000 possible words that that network could put out. So you have 500,000 connections to 500,000 other connections. So it's like I think 250 billion connections you're starting with right there. That's just the autocomplete suggestion because it, it based on those connections and studying words in the English language and phrases in the English language, it places emphasis more on some connections than others. So John Coltrane um, is uh, what's what's his album? I can't remember. The Love Supreme is a Love Supreme classic album. So John Coltrane is much more closely related to a Love Supreme in the mind of a neural network than John Coltrane. Um, Charlie Brown disco is, right? Yeah, Just to sure. take something off the top of my head. Um, and so based on that analysis and that weight that it gives to some things other than others, it suggests those words. What the large language models that like chat GPT that we're seeing today, they do the same thing. They have all those same connections. But the analysis they do, the weight that they put on the connections is so much more um, advanced. Yes, and exponential that it's it's actually not just capable of suggesting the next word, it's capable of holding a conversation with you. That's how much it understands how the English language works. Yeah, like if if, it, if you said, you know, write a story about uh, uh, wintertime and, you know, it got to the word snowy, mm -hmm. it would it would go through, you know, I mean, and this is like instantaneously, it's doing these calculations. Right. It might say like, you know, oh, hillside or, or winter or snowy day. Like these are all things that make sense mm -hmm. because I've learned that that makes sense. I being, you know, the, the chat bot or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but it probably won't be snowy chicken wing uh, because that doesn't seem to fit the algorithm. And it learns all this stuff uh, by reading the Internet and, yeah. you know, put a pin in that because that's pretty thorny for a whole lot of reasons. But. Um, not the least of which is the fact that some companies, and again, we'll get to it, are starting to say, like, wait a minute, like, we created this content, and now you're just uh, scrubbing it for, and, and then using it and charging people mm -hmm. to use it, and we're not getting a piece of it. So that's just one tiny little thorn. Uh, but in order to do this, like you said, it's like, it needs to know more. Uh, and you, you came up with a great example, like the word lemon, mm -hmm. um, in a very... Uh, basic way, it might understand that a lemon is uh, roundish and sour and yellow. Mm -hmm. But if it needs to get smart enough to really write as if it were a human, it needs to know that it can make lemonade and that it uh, grows on a tree in these agricultural zones and that it's a citrus fruit because it has to be able to group um, lemon together with like things. And those groups are either like, you know, hey, it's super similar to this, like, mm -hmm maybe other citrus fruits, or it's, you know, sort of similar to this, but not as similar citrus fruits, like desserts. 
And then you get to chicken wings, although actually that's not true because lemon uh, chicken wings. Uh, you could have lemon pepper chicken wings, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So oh, that yeah. doesn't count. But you, the instance you use was like Greenland, which I guess doesn't uh, grow lemons. No, but I mean, I'm sure they import lemons. So there's right. some connection there. But <laughs> based on how connected, how often these words show up together in the billions and billions of lines of text that these langu- large language models are trained on, it starts to um, get more and more dimensions and making more and more connections, right? So um, as that happens, words start to cluster together, like lemon and pie and icebox all kind of cluster together. And by taking words and understanding how they connect to other words, you can take the English language, just the words of the English language, and make mm-hmm. meaning out of it. That's what that's all we do. And large language models are capable of doing the same thing. But it's really, really important for you to understand that the large language model doesn't understand what it's doing. It doesn't have any meaning to the word lemon whatsoever. All of these dimensions that it waits to decide whether uh, what word it should use next, they're called um, embeddings. Yeah. They're just numerical representations. Yeah. So the higher the number, the likelier it is it goes with the word that the user just put in or that that the l- large language model just used. The lower the number, the further away it is in the cluster, right? It doesn't right. understand what it's saying to you. And as we'll see later, that accounts for a phenomenon that we're going to have to overcome for them to get smarter, which is um, called hallucinations. But that's a really critically important thing to remember. Yeah. Another critically important thing to remember is, uh, and you probably get this from what we said so far, if you already know about a little bit about it, but there's no, there's no programmer that's teaching these things and typing in inputs Mm -hmm. and then saying, here's how you learn things. Like it's, it's doing this on its own and it's learning things on its own. And what we're talking about eventually, like the, you know, where it could get super scary is when it gets to what's called emergent abilities, where it's so powerful and there's so much data that uh, it the nuance that's missing now will be there. Right. Exactly. So, um, yeah, that's when things are going to get even harder to understand, you know, to to, rem- to remind yourself that you're talking to a machine, you know? Yeah. And the other thing, too, though, even though I said humans aren't inputting this data, uh, one of the big things that um, is allowing this stuff to get smarter um, is human feedback. It's called... Um, RLHF, uh, which is reinforcement learning on human feedback. So at the end of your um, whatever you've told it to create, you can go back in and say, well, you got this wrong and this wrong. This is what that really is. And it says, thank you. I have now just gotten smarter. (laughs) Right, exactly. So one of the reasons why these things are suddenly just so smart and can say, thank you, I've just gotten so much smarter is because of a paper that Google engineers published Um, openly in 2017, describing what's now like the essential ingredient for a large language model or probably any neural network from now on. It's called a transformer. And rather than analyzing each bit of text, let's say you say um, one of the very famous things, um, Marvin Minsky was one of the founders of the field of AI, Mm -hmm. and his son Henry um, prompted chat GPT to describe what losing a, a sock in the dryer is like in the style of the Declaration of Independence, right? Right, yeah. So depending on how Henry um, Minsky typed that in, uh, the uh, before Transformers, the neural network would analyze each word and do it one increment at a time, maybe not even words, sometimes strings of just letters together, mm-hmm. phonemes even, um, if you can believe it, phonemes even. <laughs> um, and it, what the transformer does is it changes that. It allows it to analyze everything all at once. So it's mm-hmm. so much faster, not just in putting out a coherent answer to your question or or request, but in also training itself on that text. So you just feed it the Internet and it starts analyzing it and self-correcting. It trains itself. It learns on its own. And that, unfortunately, also makes AI including large language models, what are known as black boxes. Yeah. We don't know how they're doing what they're doing. We have a good idea how to make them do the things we want, but the in-between stuff, we cannot 100% say what they're doing, how they come up with these conclusions, which also explains hallucinations and them not really making sense to us. 
Yeah, and you know the the T in GPT stands for transformer. Mm-hmm. It's a generative pre-trained transformer, right. and the reason they call it GPT for short is because if they call it generative pre-trained transformer, everybody would be scared out of their mind. Yeah, we just start running around to nowhere in particular. Yeah. Uh, should we take a break? I say we do. I think that we kind of explained that fairly well. Yeah, a fairly robust beginning, my friend. All right, so um, OpenAI uh, launched their chat GPT in, mm-hmm. um, very recently in November of 2022. And just in that brief window, what was like six or eight months ago, mm-hmm. uh, things are kind of flying high and all kinds of companies are launching their own stuff. Uh, some of it is, uh, well, first of all, OpenAI is now at chat uh, GPT-4. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, more will be coming in, in quick succession. Um, but companies are launching, and we're going to talk about all of them, kind of like broad stuff like chat BT, uh, GPT and really specific stuff like, well, hey, I'm in the banking uh, business. Uh, can we just design something for banking mm-hmm. or just something for real estate? So they're also getting specific uh, on a smaller level right. um, in addition to these large like Google and Microsoft and Bing and all that stuff. Yeah, and to, to get specific, all you have to do is take an existing um, GPT large language model and um, add some software that helps guide it a little more. Um, yeah. And there you go. Uh, or just train it on specific stuff like medical notes. That's another one too. Um, one of the other things that's, that's changed very quickly between November of 2022 and March of 2023, when uh, I think GPT-4 became available. Mm-hmm. That, just think about that. That's, that's such a short amount of time. Yeah. All of a sudden now, um, you can take a picture and feed it into a large language model, and it will describe the picture. It will look at the picture essentially and describe what's going on. Um, there's a there's a demonstration from one of the guys from OpenAI who doodles like on a little like scrapbook piece of paper some ideas for a website. He takes a picture of that paper uh, that he's written on, feeds it into ChatGPT four, um, and um, it builds a website for him in a couple minutes that functions the way he was thinking of on the on the doodle scratch pad. I wonder if the only way to slow this stuff down is to literally slow down the internet again. Go back to like uh, the old days when a picture would load like three lines at a time. <laughs> right. And you'd and say describe a picture would be like someone's hair, <laughs> someone's nose, <laughs> right. someone's chin. Don't forget and, like, the an forehead hour later, in between. Yeah, yeah, an hour later you have a complete picture. Right. I don't think there's any way to slow this down because we're in, not to be alarmist, but we're in a second worst case scenario for um, introducing AI to the world, which is rather than state actors doing this, which mm-hmm. would be really bad, we yeah. have private companies doing it, which is just slightly less bad. <laughs> um, but they're competing in an arms race to get the, the best, brightest, smartest AI out there. Um, as fast as they can. And they're not taking into account like all of the downsides to it. They're just throwing it out there as much as they can. Because one of the ways that these things get smarter is by interacting with the public. They get better and better at what they do from getting uh, feedback just from um, people using them. Yeah. Even if it's for just some goofy, fun thing you're doing, it's learning from that. Uh, And you talked about the advancements made between the launch of 3.5 and uh, GPT-4. Mm-hmm. And uh, 3.5 scored in the 10th percentile uh, when it took the uniform bar exam. Uh, and 4 has already scored in the 90th percentile. And they found that chat GPT-4 is really, it, it's great at uh, taking tests and, and it's scoring really well on tests, mm-hmm. um, particularly you know, standardized tests. All I think it basically aced all of the AP um, tests that you would take to get into AP classes. Well, that's except, not that hard. Uh, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's it took kidding. a couple of AP classes. I'm totally kidding. Uh, but the max score is five, and I think it got fives kind of on everything except for 
math, mm-hmm. uh, it got a four. Uh, and math, it's kind of it's it's weird. Uh, it's kind of weirdly counterintuitive because it's a numbers based thing, mm-hmm. but it has more trouble with math, uh, like rudimentary math, than it does with like constructing a, a paragraph on you know Shakespeare or something or as Shakespeare. Uh, does better with like uh, math word problems and mm-hmm. more advanced math than it does just at basic math, apparently. Or like describing how a formula functions using, right. you know, writing. Um, the thing is, though, and this is another great example of how fast this is moving. Um, they've already figured out that all you have to do is do what's called prompting, um, where you where you basically take the answer that the the incorrect answer that the the large language model gives you. And then basically re-explain it by breaking it down into different parts. And it learns as you're doing that. And then all of a sudden it comes up with, it gets better at math. So they've figured out tools, extra software you can lay over a GPT um, that basically teach it to do math or prompt it in the correct way so that you get the answer you're looking for that's based on math. Yeah, I mean, every time I read something that said, well, right now it's not so great at this, I just assume that meant... And we'll have that worked out in the next few weeks. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, because as these things get like bigger and smarter and the data sets that they're trained on get wider, Mm -hmm. they're just going to get better and better at this because they, again, they learn from their mistakes. Mm. Uh, Yeah, just like humans, right? Exactly like humans. Um, So you mentioned these hallucinations uh, Mm -hmm. kind of briefly, and this, this is one of the big problems with them so far that Again, I'm sure they will figure this out in due time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one example that Livia found was um, to prompt it with what mammal lays the largest eggs. And one of the problems is when it gives hallucinations or wrong answers, it, it you know, it's not saying like, well, I'm not so sure about this. It's saying this is true just like anything else I'm spitting out. Right. Uh, with a lot of confidence. So the answer there was uh, the mammal that lays the largest eggs is the elephant. And elephant's eggs are so small that they are often invisible to the naked eye, so they're not commonly known to lay eggs at all. However, in terms of sheer size, an elephant's eggs are the largest of any mammal. Which makes sense in a really weird way if you think about it. (laughs) Sure, those little invisible eggs. Yeah, because mammals don't lay eggs, obviously. But the way that it put it was, if you didn't know that mammals don't lay eggs or you didn't know anything about elephants, Mm -hmm. you'd be like, oh, that's interesting, and take that as a fact because it's saying this confidently. And I saw written somewhere that um, one GPT actually argued with the user and told them they were wrong when they told the GPT really? that it was wrong. Um, yeah, which is not, that's, not that's a behavior fine. you want at all. <laughs> but the, that's that's what's termed as a hallucination. And a hallucination is a, a, a good way to understand it that I saw is that, um, the again, this this GPT, this large language model, doesn't have any idea what it's saying means. Mm -hmm. It's just picked up, it's noticed um, patterns that we've not noticed before. uh, And it's putting them together in nonsensical ways. But they're Mm -hmm. still sensible if you read them. It's just factually they're not sensible because it doesn't have any fact checking necessarily. It just knows what it's finding um, kind of correlates with other things. So there's some sensible stuff in there, like the the, the phrase invisible to the naked eye or mm-hmm. laying eggs or elephants and mammals. Like this stuff all makes sense. It's not like these are just strings of letters. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's just putting them together in ways that are not true. They're factually incorrect. And that's a hallucination. It's not like the the computer is thinking that this is true. It doesn't right. understand things like truth and, and, and falsehood. It just creates, and some of the time it gets it really, really wrong. Yeah, it doesn't know what an elephant is. No, it just knows uh, that it correlates to, in some really small way that we've never noticed before, the word eggs. Yeah, and this is, uh, th- that's a problem if if it's just like, oh, well, this thing isn't quite where it needs to be yet because it thinks elephants lay eggs. Mm-hmm. But there have ar- already been plenty of real world examples where people are using this and it's screwing things up for their business or for commerce or something. Or their client. Yeah, or their client. Well, <laughs> that's, that's one. There was an attorney who um, uh, was representing a passenger who was suing an airline and used chat BT to do research. And it came up with a bunch of fake cases that this attorney didn't bother to fact check, I guess. Mm-hmm. 
And there were like a dozen fake cases that this attorney submitted in his brief. And it wasn't like so like from what I understand, like the the brief was largely compiled from what the GPT spit out. So sure. like it wasn't like the GPT just made up the names of cases. It made up the names of cases and then described the background of the case and how they related to the, the case at hand. Right. Mm-hmm. So it just completely made these up out of out of the blue. And, yeah, that lawyer had no idea. He said in a, a brief later that he had no idea that this thing was capable of being incorrect. So it was like one of the first times he used it. And he threw himself on the mercy of the court. And I'm not quite sure exactly what happened. I think they're still figuring out what to do about it. Maybe just go spend some quality time with your little chat bot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> S- similarly, um, Meta had a, a large language model that basically got laughed off of the Internet because it was very science focused. And it would make up things that just didn't exist, like mathematical um, formula. Like there was one that called the Yoko or no, the Lenin Ono correlation or something like that mm-hmm. completely made up this thing that I read and I was like, oh, that's interesting. I had no idea. I have never heard this stuff before. And I would have just thought that it was real had I not realized or known ahead of time that it was a hallucination, that this math thing does not exist anywhere. And then even attributed it to a, a live mathematician, said that this was the guy who discovered it. Um, so, like, it really can get hard to to discern what's true and what's not, which, again, is a really big problem if we haven't gotten that across yet. Did they say that mathematician's name was uh, Math B Calculus? <laughs> yeah. Uh, another example, and this is, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, replacing jobs and, and the various ways that can and already is happening. Uh, but CNET, for instance, said, oh, you know what, let me let me try this thing out and see if we can get it to write an actual story. Uh, and so they, they got an AI uh, tool to write uh, one on what is compound interest. And it was just there was a lot of stuff wrong in it. Uh, there was some plagiarism, um, you know, directly lifted. So there's you know, these things aren't foolproof yet, and it's definitely not something that should be um, utilized for, like, a public-facing mm-hmm. website that's supposed to have, like, really solid uh, vetted articles about, uh, well, especially CNET, about the tech. <laughs> right. Of all things. That's something that the National Eating Disorder Association found out the hard way. They apparently replaced entirely its human-staffed um, hotline with a chatbot. And supposedly uh, they were accused of doing this to to bust the union that had formed there. Um, and so when they released the chatbot into the world and it started offering advice to people suffering from eating disorders, it gave standard, you know, weight loss advice, which you probably get from your doctor who didn't realize you had an eating disorder. But in the context mm-hmm. of an eating disorder, it was all like trigger, 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 one right after the other. Right. Like it was telling these people with eating disorders to like weigh yourself every week and try to cut out right. 500 to 1,000 calories a day and you'll lose some weight. Um, and just, just stuff that, that would set everybody off. And very quickly they took it offline and I guess brought their humans back, hopefully at double the pay. Yeah, but I mean this stuff is – that's already being solved as well because they point out that GPT-4 – uh, has already scored 40% higher than 3.5, again, just a handful of months ago, mm-hmm. on on these accuracy tests. So that that is even getting better. And, um, you know, where, where I guess people want it to get to is to the point where it doesn't need human supervision to spit out really, really accurate stuff. Exactly. That's pretty much where they're hoping to get it. And, I mean, it's just – they they have the model. They have everything they need. They just it just has to be tinkered with now. Should we take another break? I think so. All right, we'll take another break, and then we'll get into sort of the the economics of it and whether or not your job may be at risk. Right after this. <laughs> So one of the astounding things about this that it really caught everybody off guard is that these uh, large language models, the jobs they're coming after are white-collar knowledge jobs. Yeah. 
They're so good at things like writing. Um, they're good at researching. They're good at analyzing photos now. Um, and that's a huge sea change from what it's been like traditionally, right? Wherever, whenever we've automated things, it's usually replaced yeah. manual labor. Now it's the manual labor that's safe in this yeah. this generation of of automation. Uh, it's the white collar knowledge jobs that are at risk, and not just white collar jobs, but artists in in yeah, like just pl- who have nothing to do with white collar or jobs. Um, they're uh, at risk as well. Yeah, I'm sure the farmers. Uh, are all sitting around going, hmm, how's that going for you? Yeah, how's that taste? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, art art is um, when, when D-A-L-L-E, Doll e came out, uh, that was an art tool where um, a lot of people, a lot of people I know would input, I guess, uh, I never did it. I never do anything like that, not because I'm afraid or anything, but I just, just not interested, basically. Mm-hmm. But uh, I guess you would submit like a photograph of yourself and then it would say, well, here's you as a superhero or here's you as a a Renaissance painting or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's sourcing images from real artists throughout history, uh, from Getty images and places like that. And there are already artists that are uh, suing for infringement. Uh, Getty images is uh, suing for infringement and saying, you can't, even if you're mixing up things and it's not like a Rembrandt, let's say, you're using all of the artists from that era and mashing it up together in a way that, like, we think basically is illegal. Yeah, they, they say this is, doesn't count as transformative use, which is typically protected under under the law. Right. This is instead just some sort of mashup that that a machine is doing. Um, I, I, it's To me, it's almost splitting hairs, but I also very much get where they're coming from. Sure. Not just a place of panic, but, like, they're a real... A real um, like they have a basis in fact that these things are not transforming because they don't understand what they're doing. Yeah. And companies are taking notice very quickly. Um, there are some companies and I'm sure everyone's going to kind of fall in line that are already saying, well, no, you got to start paying us for access to this stuff. Um, we paid human beings to create this uh, content for lack of a better word mm-hmm. and put it online for people to access but you can't come in here now and access it with a bot and use it and charge for it without giving us a little juice. Right. Uh, and there are a lot of companies that are already saying, like, you you can't use this. If you're an employee of our company, you can't use chatbots at all because some of our comp- company secrets might end up um, being spilled somehow. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, our databases are all, all of a sudden exposed. So. Companies are really moving fast to try and protect their IP, I guess. Well, yeah. And one of the, I mean, the some of the companies that are behind the GPTs that are out right now, or the large language models that are out right now, are are well known for not only not protecting their users' yeah. information, but for rating it for sure. its own use. Um, like, for example, Meta is one of the ones with, a, they have, um, their large language model is called Llama. Um mm-hmm. And there's a chatbot called Alpaca, and it makes total sense that you are probably signing away your right to protect your information when you use those things on whatever computer you're using it on or whatever right. network you're using it on. Mm-hmm. I don't understand exactly. I haven't seen anything that says this is how they're doing it or even that they are definitely doing this. I think it's just that the powers that be know, like, they would totally do this if they can, and they probably are, so we should just stay keep our employees away from it, you know, as much as we can. Yeah. Um, it, it's like we said, it's being used on uh, smaller levels by uh, one of the um, uses that Livia dug up was like, let's say a real estate agent, um, instead of taking time to write up listings, mm-hmm. um, has a chat bot do it. And then they can go through afterward and make adjustments to it mm-hmm. um, as needed. Or, but in exchange, that database now knows right. exactly what you mm-hmm. think of that one ugly bathroom. That's right. <laughs> or doctors may be uh, using it to, to compile lists of um, possible uh, diseases or conditions that someone might have based on symptoms. Yeah. Uh, th- these all sound like uses that are like, hey, th- this sounds like it could be a good thing in some ways. And it can be in some ways, but it's the Wild West right now. So it's not <laughs> like there's any um, 
there's anyone saying, well, you can't use it for that. You can only use it for this. You know what I'm saying? Plus, also, everything that we've come up with as just Internet users in the general public has been what we could come up with in given three months with no warning that we should yeah. start thinking about this. It's just like, hey, this is here. What are you going to do with it? And people are just oh, finding new things to do with it every day. Um, and yeah, some of them are benign, like um, like having it, uh, it draft a blog post for your business. I thought yeah. they were already doing that based on some of the emails that I get from like businesses, <laughs> right? Yeah. But they definitely are now if they weren't before. And that's totally cool because there's there's a, it's just taking some of the weight off of the humans that are already doing this work, right? What's going to be problematic is when it comes for the full job or enough of the job that the company can transfer whatever's left of that person's job to other people and make them just work a little harder uh, while they're supported by the AI. Yeah. Um, here are some stats that they were pretty shocking to me. I didn't know it was moving this fast, but um, there's a networking app called Fishbowl. And in 2023, just earlier this year, uh, they found that 40 percent of uh, what they call working professionals are already using some kind of either chat GPT or some kind of AI tool mm -hmm. while they work, whether it's generating uh, idea lists or brainstorming lists or actually writing stuff or, or uh, maybe looking at code. And this is the troubling part. 40 uh, of those 40 percent, um, almost 70 percent are doing that in secret and hadn't told their bosses that they were doing that. Right. Those are just working professionals. We haven't even started talking about students yet. Yeah. I mean, you combine that with work from home, you got a real racket going on. <laughs> For sure. You know? Yeah, no, totally. Again, though, I mean, like if you can use it to do good work and you can now do more work, I think you should be paid for more work. Like if your productivity has gone through the roof, great. Uh, you figured it out. I've got no problem with that. It's the opposite that I have the problem with. Well, let's skip students for a second then and talk about that since you brought it up. Okay. Because here's the, the thing. Um, this is uh, the United States doesn't have a great track record of um, ignoring the bottom line in favor of just keeping hardworking humans uh, at their jobs. Right. Uh, so I think it was uh, Goldman Sachs said that they found um, that, that there could actually be an increase in the annual GDP by about 7% over 10 years because productivity increases. And I guess the idea is that productivity is increasing because let's say you've got 20 to 30% of stuff being done by AI, mm -hmm. that opens up 20 to 30% of your time for your employees to maybe innovate or, you know, get, do other capitalistic things. Um, but what it, to me, and this is just my opinion, and again, we're really early in all this, but it, it's a bottom line world and especially a bottom line country that we live in. And I imagine it will, what it would likely mean is, is bye-bye jobs right. more than it means, well, Hey, you've got more time and why don't you innovate at your job? Because <laughs> for most jobs, it'll probably be like, oh, wait a minute. If we can teach it to do 40% of your job, mm -hmm. I bet we could train it to do a 100%. Yeah. Or we can get rid of, a, you know, a bunch of you and just keep some of you to, to do the other 60%, you know? But now, see, these people are out of jobs. It's going to bite them in the rear, though, because it's not ultimately going to be, well, who knows? It doesn't seem like it could be good for the overall economy if all of a sudden all these people are out of jobs because mm -hmm. people being out of jobs mean they're not. That means the economy is going to tank. They're not spending. Yeah. And it's not like a situation where, um, you know, the the tractor replaced the plow uh, and then the robot tractor replaced the tractor. But, hey, now we've got these better jobs where you're designing and building these robot tractors and they're higher paying mm -hmm. and they're great. Um, it's not like that because, you know, the farmer was replaced who drove that tractor. Right. And isn't skilled in the practice of designing robot tractors. Right. And in this case, in most cases, they're not being uh, there's not some other job waiting for someone who got fired in the world of designing AI. Right. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense. But yeah. And in this case, one of the big differences is instead of the farmer having to go figure out how to work a computer, the people working computers now have to go figure out how to be farmers. 
in, in right. order to sustain themselves, yeah. right? There you go. But you're yeah. right. Um, we don't have a track record of taking care of people very well, at least, who are out of a job. And I mean, without getting on a soapbox here, what what's either going to come out of this? Because there's going to be one or the other. The status quo as it is now or as it was in, as of up to 2022, we don't know that that's going to be around anymore. Instead, we'll either do something like create universal basic income for people mm-hmm. to, to be like, hey, you li- your industry literally does not exist anymore. And it just happened overnight, basically. We're just going to make sure that everybody's at least minimally taken care of while we're figuring out what comes next. Or it's going to be like, good luck, chump. You're fired. You're out on your own. Um, instead, we're going to take all this extra wealth, this extra $2 trillion that's going to be generated and push it upward toward the wealthy instead. And everybody else is just the, the, the divide between wealthy and not wealthy is just going to exponentially grow. One of those two things is going to happen because I don't, I don't see how there's just going to be a regular middle ground like there is now where it's kind of shaky and mm-hmm. how we're taking care of people um, because there's just going to be so many layoffs and fairly skilled workers being laid off too. We've just well, never encountered that before. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that these, um, the largest corporations might want to think about is all it's going to take is one um, CEO of a huge corporation <laughs> uh, to say, wait a minute, it. I think I can get rid of 75% of the VPs in my, co- in my company. Right. And like who, unless who except the person at the very, very top of that food chain is protected? And the answer is nobody. No, no. The offen- essentially the- at the end of the day, because they make a lot of money. If you it's one thing to lay off a bunch of, you know, technical writers that are all sitting in their cubicles. But if you start laying off those those VPs who get those big bonuses, that's more bonus money. And, you know, are we looking at a situation where a corporation is run by uh, one human? I mean, it's entirely possible. Like you could make a really good case that what it is going to wipe out is the middle management, like right. VPs, just exactly like you said, and that we still will need some humans to do some stuff. Like the board, take care of the board, right? <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah. But yes, you. I mean, who knows? We just, we have no idea at this point. Ultimately, it could very easily provide for a much better, um, healthier society, at least financially speaking. It could, it could do that especially yeah. given a long enough period of time. I'm a cynic when it comes to that kind of trust, though. You know? I am as well, for sure. But if you look back in history, at the history of technology, overall, especially if you just turn a blind eye to human suffering for a second and you just look at <laughs> the progress of society, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. In a lot of ways, it has just gotten better and better thanks to technology. There's also a lot of downsides to it. Nothing's black and white. No, it's just not. The, that's just not how sure. things are. So there's, of course, going to be problems. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be people left behind. There's going to be people that fall through the cracks. It's just inevitable. We just don't know how many people, for how long, and what will happen to those people on the other side of this transition. Yeah. I was talking with somebody the other day about uh, the writer's strike Mm -hmm. um, in Hollywood. The WGA is striking right now. Uh, For those of you who don't know, it's kind of all over the place, but um, one of the things that they have argued for in this uh, round of negotiations is, hey, you can't replace us with AI. And the studios all came back and said, well, how about this? We'll assess that on a year to year basis. <laughs> and that's that's frightening if you're um, if you're either a writer in Hollywood or you're somebody who loves TV and films and, and quality TV and films, yeah. because uh, I I don't know if. I think ideation and initial scripts, maybe even right now, could um, I could see that happening where they said they're like, all right, now we'll bring in um, a human to refine this thing at a much lower wage. That's probably what they're most afraid of rather than being wholesale replaced, because like you said, this, these programs are um, they're all about just data and numbers. They're not right. uh, they don't have human feelings. And that's what art is. And so. I think I would be more concerned if I was writing pamphlets for Verizon or something, or if I was some uh, pamphlet if, writer for Verizon just went gulp. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. 
Um, but like BuzzFeed back in the day, instead of having a, a dozen writers writing clickbait articles, mm-hmm. why not have just one human that is a prompt engineer that's managing a, a, a virtual AI uh, clickbait room that's just pumping out these articles that, you know, they were paying someone down at 40 grand a year to write previously? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Like that was a horrific, horrible job to have not too many years ago. So it's great to have a computer do it. But that means that we need these other people to go on to be um, to have writing jobs that are more satisfying to them than that. But that's not necessarily the case, because as these things get smarter and better, um, we're, they're just going to be relied upon more. We're not going to go back. There's no going back now. It just happened like it just yeah. happened basically as of March 2023. Uh, yeah. And one of the one of the big problems um, that people have already projected running into is if if computers replace human, say, writers, mm-hmm. uh, basically entirely, eventually all the stuff that humans have written on the Internet is going to become dated. It's going to stop. Yeah. And it will have been replaced and picked up on by um, by generative pre-trained transformers, right? Mm-hmm. And eventually all the writing on the internet after a certain date will have been written by computers, but will be yeah. being scraped by computers when humans go ask the computer a question. Yeah. The computer then goes and references something written by a computer. So humans will be completely taken out of the equation in that in that respect. We'll be getting all of our information at least non-historical information from non-humans. And that could be a really big problem, not just in in the fact that we're losing jobs or in the fact that computers are now telling us all of our information, but also that there's some um, there's some part of of what humans put into things that will be lost that I think we're going to demand. I saw somebody put it like, I think um, I can't remember who it was, but they said, we're going we're, like people will go seek out human written stuff. There will always mm-hmm. be audiences for human written stuff. Yeah, maybe like you said, we'll rely on on computers to write the the Verizon pamphlets, but we're not going to rely on computers to write great works of literature or to create great works of art. Yeah. Like we're just not going to. They'll still do that. They're, they're going to be writing books and movies and all that, but there will always be a taste in a market for human created stuff. This guy said, and I think I think he's right. Yeah, and. Um... Justine Bateman. I don't know if you saw that. Um, I don't know if it was a blog post or if. if Are you having how... a hallucination right now? Did you mean Justine Bateman? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Justine Bateman, the uh, Jason Bateman's sister, the okay. uh, actor. And um, she's done all kinds of things since then. I know she has a, a computer science degree, so she's very smart and knows a lot about this stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, she basically said, and this is beyond just the the chatbot stuff, but she was like, right now there are major Hollywood stars being scanned. Um, and they, there may be a, a a brand new Tom Cruise movie in 60 years. Yeah. Uh, long after he's dead starring Tom Cruise, his, he may be making movies for the next 200 years. And like, is this what you want actors? Do you want to be scanned and have them use your image like this in perpetuity, Mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, um, there will be money involved. It's not like they can just say, okay, we can just do whatever we want. But what if they're like, here's a billion dollars, Tom Cruise, um, just for the use of your image uh, in perpetuity, because we, we'll be able to dupl- duplicate that so realistically mm-hmm. that people won't know. Um, human voices, same thing. That's already happening. Um, what? Yeah, <laughs> it is. So that stuff is kind of scary. And you know, when you read, uh, I, I didn't really know this was kind of already happening in companies, but um, Livia found this stuff. IBM CEO uh, Arvind Krishna yeah. said just last month in May that he believed 30 percent of back office jobs could be replaced uh, over the, over five years. And it was pausing hiring for close to 8000 positions because they might be able to use AI instead. And then Dropbox um, talked about the AI era when they announced a round of layoffs. So it is happening right now in real time. Pretty amazing. Yeah, that's, I mean, there's proof positive right there. Like that guy couldn't even wait a a couple months, a year. Like this really started up in March and he's saying this in May. Already in May, they're like, wait, wait, stop hiring. We're going to eventually replace these guys with AI. So soon that we're going to stop hiring those positions for now until the AI is competent enough to take over. 
I mean, how many people does IBM employ? What's what's thirty percent of that? I don't know. I would say at it's least a hundred. At least a hundred people, yeah. right? <laughs> So, yeah, like you said, it's happening already. And then one other thing to look out for, too, that I believe is already at least theoretically possible, since AI um, can write code now, um, they'll be able to create new um, large language models themselves. So the computers will be able to create new AI. Well, that's the singularity, right? No, the singularity is when (laughs) one of them understands what it is and becomes sentient. that's right, that's right. Sentient. Yes, that's the singularity. But this leads to that, though, doesn't it? It does. It's hypothetically, yes, but we just understand what's going on so little that you just can't say either way, really. You definitely can't say that, it. no, it won't happen. It's just fantasy. And you also can't say, yes, it's definitely going to happen. Yeah. And here's the thing, man. I'm not a uh, um, paranoid technophobe. Mm-hmm. You don't and have an any measure. foil cap on? <laughs> no, by any measure. I'm, I'm a pretty positive thinker. Uh, and this, this is pretty scary to me. I'm just going to leave that there. (laughs) Agreed, Chuck. Okay. (laughs) Uh, if you want to know more about large language models, everybody just, (laughs) just start looking around earth. And when you see people running from explosions, go toward it and ask what's going on. (laughs) You almost said type it into a search engine, right? (laughs) Yeah. Steer clear of those. Yeah. There's so much more we could have talked about, but. This is, if you ask me, this is round one. I think we definitely need to do at least one or so more on this, okay? Yeah, and then one day, like I said, uh, AI Josh and Chuck will just wrap it all up and spank it on the bottom and say, no problems here. Hopefully they'll give us a billion dollars rather than like a, a, a month free of Blue Apron instead. Yeah, I mean, we can talk, you know. <laughs> uh, well, since Chuck said we can talk, real confidential-like, that means it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this Conception. Uh, not Inception, but Conception. Oh, I saw this one. I don't know how yeah. I feel about this. <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, last year, my wife and I were attempting to get pregnant. A couple of months in, we made plans to stay with some friends in another town for a weekend. And when the re- uh, weekend arrived, it happened to coincide uh, with my wife's ovulation cycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, as shy people, we both felt a little bit awkward about, uh, you know, hugging and kissing uh, in a friend's guest room. Mm-hmm. But we really didn't want to miss that chance uh, and that time of the month. So we went about getting in the mood as quietly as possible. And my wife suggested we play a podcast from my phone so that, you know, if any noise is made outside the room, uh, it would sound like we were just doing a little pre-bedtime listening. Uh, I knew I needed something with nice, simple production values so we wouldn't get distracted, of course, by the whiz-bang sounds and whatnot. And since you were my intro to the world of podcasts, I've always had a steady supply of yours downloaded. I picked the least interesting sounding one in the feed at the time. What was it? How how coal works. Oh, okay. I thought that one turned out to be surprisingly interesting. Yeah. Um, I could see how we would have thought that, though. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we put that on, and we did our business. Uh, six weeks later, we got a positive pregnancy test. Wow. And now, over a year later, we've welcomed our son into the world. His name is Cole. And, of course, we named him Cole. Uh, that is what uh, this person said. Wait a they minute, wait a me, minute. They really did name him Cole? No, they, uh, he said it is a joke. Oh. But great minds, right? Sure. Good joke yeah. for both of you. Uh, it's almost like you're both uh, chatbots. Um, and uh, this person said, uh, you're fine to read this, but give me a fake name. And so I just want to say thanks to Gene for writing in about this. Gene is in Gene Transfer? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Gene. We appreciate that. I think, again, I'm still figuring that one out. Um, and if you want to be like Gene, I'm making air quotes here, uh, you can send us an email to wrap it up, spank it on the bottom. Only humans can do that. Uh, I wonder if when you said spank it on the bottom, if that uh, created any issues. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe uh, playfully. How about that? Sure. Uh, and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.